To introduce our speaker tonight, we have a senior from Cincinnati, Ohio, majoring in political economy, the opinions page editor of the Collegian. Give it up for Jack Butler. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin with a question. I don't have a door prize, uh, sorry. But my question is, do any of you know how long the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, is? Anyone? The hmm? The ah, that's a good, you know what, I'll let that be the best answer. Because <laughs> the final pass statute itself runs only about a thousand pages. So that's like the Affordable Care Act, the text of it. Um, but versions of the bill ran upwards of 2,000 pages during the debate and drafting, which is why the 2,700 figure is correct in some sense. Um, but more important, as of as long ago as 2013, there have been, depending on how you count, uh, around 30,000 page of, pages of association, associated regulations issued, which is a lot. Um, a couple years ago, Mitch McConnell had a big stack of those regulations. He was showing it off. Uh, reading the act itself proved too much for justices of the Supreme Court in 2012 when they heard a case on Obamacare's constitutionality. Asked by an Obama administration lawyer during uh, hearings if the court could go through the whole act and determine which parts were unconstitutional, Justice Antonin Scalia uh, wondered what happened to the Eighth Amendment. And in case you were asleep during Constitution 101, uh, the Eighth Amendment pro prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> uh, but if we were to defend liberty and to know what such odious pieces of legislation truly contain, somebody has to subject himself to this punishment. Uh, now, I'd, I actually asked uh, Joseph Rago if he had read uh, all of Obamacare, and he said most of it, but I doubt he's read all 33,000 or so pages of Obamacare-related text. Uh, but his writing, even so, has demonstrated a better understanding and knowledge of it than just about any other pundit today. Uh, a 2005 Dartmouth College graduate with a history degree, Joseph Rago joined the Wall Street Journal that same year as an assistant editorial features editor and now serves as a member of its esteemed editorial board. In 2010, he was a media fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. And in 2011, he became one of the youngest ever winners of the Pulitzer Prize, earning recognition for his well-crafted, against-the-grain editorials challenging the health care reform advocated by President Obama. Uh, specifically, he won the prize for a string of editorials from December to April of 2010 when, and just after, Obamacare was being debated in Congress that dissected and showed the flaws in its various components and ultimately demonstrated that, stripped of its illusions, Obamacare is really about who commands the country's medical resources, as he wrote on the eve of Obamacare's passage in 2010. But he's not just a healthcare wonk. He has also written for the journal on many other subjects, including, most recently, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, uh, the Islamic State, Republican Resurgence in New England, and Dartmouth Fraternity Life, among other things. For the writings of a relatively young journalist to exude such breadth and expertise simultaneously is truly a sign of immense promise. Perhaps someday his output might equal in volume the amount of Obamacare-related regulations. And if not, he'll certainly be more widely read. At any rate, please join me in welcoming Joseph Rago. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you to Hillsdale for the hospitality. And definitely thanks to all of you for turning out uh, on a Thursday night for a talk about the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, uh, Obamacare, if I can use that term, in polite, polite company. Uh, and um, uh, I'm not sure I would have done the same as an undergraduate, so I, I appreciate it. And it's because health policy can be uh, somewhat dry, a little bit tedious at times, and I promise to try not to bore you, and at any rate, uh, to make this talk a little bit shorter and less arduous uh, than a Hillsdale bus trip to Washington. <laughs> uh, and so I, I want to say a word or two about what to do about Obamacare, and the, the one thing I hope to convince you of uh, tonight is that health care is at the center of American politics, uh, and it has to be. Uh, we've got about a hundred million people who are covered uh, by taxpayers. Taxpayers buy about 1.2 trillion dollars worth of health care 
uh, every year, and that's before Obamacare uh, has really kicked in. We spend, as an economy, about one of six dollars uh, on health care, and that's headed to one of five. Uh, if health care was a separate economy, it would be the size of France, uh, the sixth largest uh, in the world. And if you're a conservative and you wonder why conservative Republicans haven't been able to reduce the size of government, well, one reason is the government is an insurance company that also has a standing army. So if you can't do something about health care, it's very hard to reduce government. And if you're a liberal wondering, I don't know if there's any in the audience, uh, but if you, if you want, say, more redistribution in the name of income inequality, it's, it's hard to do because we're already spending uh, so much on health care. And if you're wondering why American politics are so angry and so polarized and so dysfunctional, I think one reason uh, is Obamacare. And this is a law that set the political tone uh, for the Obama presidency. It was crammed through Congress on a partisan majority without really any kind of rough national consensus. Uh, an entitlement the country didn't want and couldn't afford that continues to haunt us uh, to this day. And it's bad, I think, politically for both parties in the sense that Republicans can't get rid of it uh, and, Democrat, and Democrats can't fix it. Uh, but all that being said, uh, I should say, confessing my own biases, uh, that I'm the one person I can say uh, unreservedly and confidently who has benefited the most uh, from Obamacare. I like to call it the Joe Rego Lifetime Employment Act. Uh, and when the Speaker of the House, uh, as we all remember, says we have to pass the bill to find out what's in it, uh, that's really a winning Powerball ticket for a journalist, so I, I can say, uh, that I have benefited, but I also want to talk tonight uh, about how the politics of healthcare are maybe changing uh, and why this might be the moment that some of the problems before Obamacare, created by Obamacare, uh, and what might be solved after uh, Obamacare in a way that leave us a richer and fairer and ultimately healthier uh, country. And these changes have to do uh, with the presidential race coming up, especially with the Supreme Court case that's going to be argued next week, uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit. But I do want to say that really there are emerging and genuine reform alternatives that could fix some of the problems and perhaps even more amazingly have a chance this time in Washington. Uh, now, as we get started, you really can't understand the Affordable Care Act unless you understand health care politics. And in this case, those begin in 2009. We've got a young new president who's been elected seemingly in repudiation uh, of the old one from a previous party. Uh, Democrats swept into power with huge supermajorities. Uh, Republicans couldn't stop a swinging door. Uh, in Great Society days, uh, we're here again. In David Axelrod's new book, his memoir uh, of the Obama presidency, he recalls when the president was told he just won the Nobel Peace Prize, and Mr. Obama responds, well, that's great, but I'd just really like to pass the health care bill. Uh, I don't know whether that says something about the Nobel Peace Prize or President Obama's qualifications for it, maybe both, uh, but it does give you a sense of the feeling at the time. And President Obama, I think, with this plan, was joining uh, a debate that we've had uh, in the country uh, since about the days uh, of Harry Truman. And as different as left and right are on health care, they've all kind of agreed for all these years on one thing, and that it's that the U.S. has a free market health care system. For liberals, this is a problem that needs to be overcome. It's something that needs to be fixed. Uh, and for conservatives, it's been for many years a virtue to defend, and we saw that uh, in this debate. Uh, of course, critics called the law uh, too costly, uh, too destructive, bad for economic growth. Those were the more charitable comments. Uh, but sometimes they even called it un-American. Uh, and from my perspective, that's not really it. It's that the law is too American. Uh, it's not a rupture or a discontinuity, uh, but it's really an acceleration of a half century of progress from markets 
to government and healthcare, from competition to consolidation, uh, and from liberty to government control. Uh, it's a larger transfer of power. It's a, it's a jump uh, in this progression. It's unlike anything we've seen uh, since 1965, uh, but it's really the same approach that we saw under George W. Bush, under Bill Clinton, under George H. W. Bush, even Ronald Reagan, all the way back uh, to LBJ. So here's how it always works in Washington. People identify some problem in healthcare, and they say, here's the solution. Here's the thing that will solve the problem once and for all. That solution passes, and it inevitably fails. The next generation says, well, we need a solution for the solution, resulting in another failure, a solution for the solution for the solution, and so on in an endless recursive loop. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, here's, here's the first item. Uh, today, doctors and hospitals use a system. Uh, they're called CPT codes. There's about 14,000 of them. Uh, and they use these codes whenever they perform a medical procedure uh, to bill the government or bill an insurance company for something they've done. Right now, we're expanding that. It's called ICT-10. Uh, and we're going from about 14,000 codes to 140,000. Uh, and they're meant to catalog everything that medicine could possibly achieve, everything that doctors could possibly do. Uh, so, there will now be 72 codes for injuries due to birds, bitten by a parrot, struck by a parrot, contact with parrot, then it repeats with ducks, macaws, geese, turkeys, chickens, and a category, other fowl. There are codes for injuries sustained in opera houses, art galleries, squash courts, and mobile homes. There is a code for people who spend too much time in a deep freeze refrigerator. <laughs> Though not too much time, because there is also a code for death. There are codes for walked into a lamppost, initial encounter. Walked into a lamppost, subsequent encounter. <laughs> that is, walked into a lamppost more than once. <laughs> there is a category, burn due to water seas on fire. I'm not making this up. <laughs> now you could say maybe this new iteration is more accurate, maybe, uh, but it's really complexity taken to the point of absurdity and beyond. And this is what we've always seen uh, in healthcare. The difference with Obamacare uh, is that what we were told, President Obama said, you can expect superior scientific and technocr technocratic leadership from President Obama uh, and, and his allies. The spirit of the age was that all healthcare decisions are too important and too complex to be left to ordinary citizens, to ordinary patients. And the guiding conceit of the law is that medicine should be even more ruled by experts who are dis allegedly disinterested, dispassionate, rational, post-ideological, pragmatic, who will follow reason wherever it will lead, uh, and the truth of what, and find the truth of what works and what doesn't. And what I argue is that this is not new. Um, we've tried this for a long time. Uh, since Medicare and Medicaid were created in 1965, we instantly had a health cost explosion. So what the Jimmy Carter administration said was, well, we just need price controls on hospitals, and that will solve the problem. Uh, Ronald Reagan, of all people, continued the work, created something known as the Prospective Payment Program, which consolidated the Carter price controls into 746 com distinct diagnoses. These diagnoses-related groups continue uh, to this day. In 1998 and, during the and later during the Clinton administration, we tried to refine the diagnosis-related groups. It was a uh, professor at Harvard, and this is fodder for the theory that Harvard can ruin anything. Uh, an economist at Harvard, William Sow, uh, decided that what Medicare really needed was a better formula. He called it a relative value scale. It's supposed to measure not only what doctors do, but the time, effort, judgment, skill, and stress of fixing these problems uh, uh, entails. And now this formula is now applied to about 7,000 
physician services. So it's a, it's a problem that didn't begin with Obamacare, but it's a problem that Obamacare amplified, increased, and, and uh, the results have been predictable. Uh, in, in 1962, we spent about 6% of the economy on health care thereabouts. Uh, now it's 17%, and as I mentioned, going up to 20% by the end of the decade. Medicaid, Medicare's unfunded liability, which is the gap between the benefits that we have promised to people who pay taxes and the taxes we have levied to pay them, uh, is about $31 trillion over the next 75 years, about the life of someone born today. Now, $31 trillion is a number beyond human comprehension. But what the Obama people who came in said, this is the problem we inherited. But no, 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 we're smarter. We know better. This time, we'll do it right. The old price controls have failed. We just need better price controls, and it's a version of an old joke, which is that the soup is terrible and the portions are too small. So now with this law, and I think this is really the worst feature of it, it's price controls on steroids, where the government decides to pay more for treatments that the government determines are more valuable, to pay less for treatments that they decided are wasteful, to encourage physicians to practice this way rather, rather than that way. It takes insurance and it defines what insurance is, uses public power to compel consumers to buy that defined product, it imposes price controls on how much insurance should cost. Now, at least the best you can say about this method is that it's economically consistent. In our world of infinite wants and finite resources, there are really only two ways to allocate any good or service, either through prices and the decisions of millions of individuals, or else through central planning and political discretion. This choice is inexorable, and we got more uh, of the latter. The problem, I think, and it, is that it closes off the other options, the things we haven't tried. It inhibits decentralization, competition, innovation, creativity, evolution, uh, and learning. And this is a problem that's really culminating in Obamacare, but it, it didn't begin there. It's, as I said, it accelerates the march to a state-driven system, but it did not originate with it. And for that, I think you have to go back to the original sins, the original policy choices, the original solutions that, it, that inspired all the other solutions uh, that I mentioned earlier. And there are two things here. One uh, is employer-sponsored insurance. We, during the World War II era, we imposed wage controls uh, on private employers, but we decided to exempt health care benefits. That means that all employer-sponsored insurance is offered tax-free, but wages are taxed still to this day. Uh, and what it's led to is employers paying their workers more in benefits and less in take-home pay. Uh, and people who buy health insurance on their own aren't entitled to the same benefits they have to use after tax dollars. This is not very good for the self-employed, for small businesses, for entrepreneurs, uh, and for a lot of other people. And like the company store, uh, this inefficient and inequitable preference encourages workers to be paid in kind rather than cash. And the third-party payment system it created uh, has inhibited competition and eliminated very often even private price tags uh, in medicine. We encourage most normal middle-class Americans, about 150 million of us, to launder their incomes through the healthcare system rather than making their own trade-offs, I think, between healthcare and everything else. Uh, the other problem is the entitlement state, and it begins with Medicare. This is called fee-for-service, where in the traditional program, any doctor or hospital a patient visits is paid a lump sum, one of those price controls, one of their codes, uh, and the same arbitrary fee schedule applies to the best hospital and to the worst hospital, to the best doctor and the worst doctor, regardless of the quality, of the quality or the value of the care that they deliver. Providers who find a way to deliver better results at lower costs aren't rewarded like they would be uh, in any other in industry. And it makes perfect sense that this has lasted for so long, for this half century 
Uh, entitlements, the best way to understand them, is as an ocean of money surrounded by people who want some. And their incentive is always to increase the amount we spend, increase the size of the ocean, rather than providing a better answer. Uh, and th the problem here, this, this whole system has arisen uh, because liberals think of healthcare, they con conceive of healthcare as some fixed thing, some commodity that can be defined. You know, we've got the codes, there's a code for that. Uh, and what they've denied is that prices are a signal that includes an incentive. And they're most valuable uh, in, in a field like medicine, a field that's highly complex, highly dynamic, where the evidence changes constantly with medical progress, new and better ways of extending and improving lives, new understandings of the enormous variability of human disease, of biology, uh, and of patient preference. So what we, I think what we need to do is we need uh, to give consumers the incentive to save money and providers and insurers the freedom and the information that they need uh, to conceive of other options. And the healthcare economy can work just like any other uh, part of, of American industry. Uh, and it, the, we haven't done this. We haven't done it for so long and it explains I think everything people don't like about the current system, and it's not just the ever-rising costs, uh, it's, it's everything. It's the unfathomable $100,000 bill uh, for a sprained ankle. It's a doctor who doesn't use email. It's grandma's eight specialists who aren't even aware of each other's existence. Why is healthcare conducted via pad and pen? And still, to this day, often beepers and fax machines uh, in the iPhone era. Why, for example, are there so few geriatricians when so many people are now turning 65? Why can't I get a price for an MRI? Why can't we find any usable and meaningful information about prices uh, and quality. So that's, that's the larger problem. But I want to talk about a political problem, which is that Republicans have often been slow, I think, uh, to recognize some of these realities. Uh, broad conservative interest in health care, uh, as I said, has mainly taken the form of opposing liberal attempts uh, to take over the system rather than uh, putting forward credible ideas of their own. And this isn't to say that no one on the right was interested or the, that the think tanks didn't have their white papers, but there was never any real mass appeal. Uh, healthcare has never been like tax reform or gun rights or immigration or national security, judges. I mean, you can go down the list and you don't, historically, you haven't revved up a crowd by saying, let's equalize the tax treatment of health insurance. It is not exactly an inspiring rally cry. Um, and politics, like nature, abhors a vacuum. And so while Republicans vi vigorously opposed Obamacare, they rarely put forward a plan of their own. There were a few things. There was things like medical malpractice reform, but nothing really commensurate with the pre-existing conditions uh, that, that were around prior to Obamacare. Now, since the law passed, uh, they've opposed it, and I give them credit for doing so, but they've done so on a platform of repeal and replace. They've said, we're going to repeal the law and replace it with something better. So repeal and replace, repeal and replace, but they've never released or come to even a rough consensus uh, about a replacement. And that really is what's changing. Uh, the debate is being joined uh, not in this positive, negative sense, but as two constructive uh, or at least positive plans for the future uh, of health care. And I can't say it's because Republicans read the Wall Street Journal editorial page and take our advice. Uh, it's really because uh, of a Supreme Court case. Uh, it's called King versus Burwell, uh, and it's going to be argued next week uh, on Wednesday. A decision is expected in June. And this is a case that involves no great questions of constitutional uh, interpretation. Uh, the question at the heart of the case really is, is Obamacare a law or not? 
In other words, what the plaintiffs are asking uh, is for the High Court to uphold the Affordable Care Act uh, as it was written and instruct the administration to faithfully execute the plain language uh, of the statute that President Obama passed, excuse me, that Congress passed and President Obama signed. And if you look at Obamacare, or at least the version that passed Congress in 2010, uh, the law instructed the states to establish these insurance exchanges. And if they didn't, the administration was empowered to create a federal fallback exchange uh, in those states. The law, quote, says that the subsidies will only be available to the people who enroll through an exchange established by the state. Uh, and the question in King uh, is whether these taxpayer subsidies can be distributed through the federal exchange as well uh, as the administration insists. Now, if we go back to the debate, people were not really paying attention to the details. They were only paying attention uh, to, the to the politics. But the record, uh, as it exists, is that this decision was no accident. Uh, Democrats among themselves were divided over the structure of the exchange. Uh, liberals favored some kind of national clearinghouse. Uh, some of the more moderate Democrats favored state control. And these Federalists won out uh, and conditioned the subsidies on the state-based exchanges. Now, there are constitutional reasons for doing this as well. Uh, the federal government cannot commandeer the sovereign states uh, under the Constitution. So what they wanted to do was create, whether they knew it or not, uh, an incentive for governors to participate uh, voluntarily. If, they, if the governors didn't participate uh, by taking the quid of the exchanges, they would be denying their voters uh, the quo of eligibility for what could turn out to be billions of dollars worth uh, of benefits. But I think Democrats also miscalculated. They were convinced that opposition to Obamacare would melt away, that Americans would learn to love the law, and that did not happen. Uh, 36 states, now up to 37, uh, either opted out of the state-established exchanges, uh, or they failed to make the arduous regulatory deadlines. So here the administration, this is about 2012, uh, faced three choices. They could obey their own law, deny subsidies to the two-thirds of the population uh, that lives in states with a federal exchange, uh, and then thus greatly diminish uh, President Obama's legacy project, what is health care. They could also, uh, number two, go to Congress for a legislative fix, uh, but they didn't do that as a result uh, of, of the sort of political estrangement that continues to this day. And they had a third option, which is the one they took, which is that they could improvise a workaround. What they did was they, through uh, an IRS rule, they rewrote the law uh, and simply declared <laughs> that the subsidies would be available on the federal exchanges too, uh, essentially declaring the federal government uh, as the 51st state. Now, Will the Supreme Court overrule the subsidies? Uh, the joke I like to use is that it will be a 5-4 decision. Uh, in matters uh, such as this, th this, this is really not, a, as I said, a constitutional question. Legislative intent is irrelevant. And matters, in matters of statutory interpretation, what controls is the plain meaning of the words of the law. And here, the text is clear. Uh, it's consistent, it's tightly worded, it says subsidies in state-based exchanges only. Uh, on the other hand, the question is politically and legally fraught. Uh, the administration has kind of a rotisserie of arguments for why the Supreme Court should reject the challenge. Some claim it's a, merely a drafting error. Others say that the statute has to be interpreted in context in terms of its larger purposes and intents, which was to provide uh, allegedly universal uh, health care. Uh, if you're looking for my exact guess, I think what they're going to do is throw the matter back to Congress and say, stop bringing your problems to us. You fix this, political branches get us out of it. Uh, but I think it will be a closed run thing. The What's really concentrating minds in Washington, however, 
uh, is the possibility of overturning the federal subsidies and it's scrambling the politics uh, of health care and maybe convincing the Republicans to operate, uh, to adopt a more coherent uh, approach. If the Supreme Court forces Washington to reopen the law by turning down the subsidies, uh, the question Republicans really need to answer is whether they're going to solve the problems uh, the Democrats created or simply allow the Obamacare damage uh, to grow. And I think this is a really interesting debate. It's an urgent challenge to those of us uh, who oppose the law and especially uh, to avoid a disaster of our own making. And it, it, things right now have broken out kind of into three schools, three repeal and replace schools. Uh, the first are people who think that repeal is, at this point, pretty unrealistic, uh, but think that Obamacare can be kind of fixed at the margins, maybe massaged in the center, uh, and Obamacare can be reformed to move health care uh, in a more free market uh, direction. The second group uh, are people who think the law can be repealed, uh, but only if Republicans have uh, a credible alternative. So this is kind of the traditional rep repeal and replace school. Uh, and the third, uh, which is a growing group right now, uh, there are people who think the law can be repealed entirely, that we can return to the pre-Obamacare status quo ante, uh, and if the Supreme Court does part of the dirty work, uh, that's fine with us. We don't need to do anything uh, in response. This is a group of Republicans who <coughs> excuse me, were uh, inspired in a lot of ways to join politics as a result of the Affordable Care Act. They were elected in 2010 and then in 2014, and they, they've created some of the major train wrecks for Republicans in recent years. Uh, I'm thinking of the government shutdown uh, of last year, the current impasse perhaps over immigration uh, funding, and these Republicans who want the judicial rapture to arrive, what they say is, look, Obamacare has never been popular. If the subsidy foundation of the law is undermined, uh, the rest will collapse uh, of its own weight. And there's, there's a regulatory quirk. A lot of the subsidies, mandates, and taxes are conditioned on each other. So if the subsidies are repealed, so will all the rest of it. Uh, and more people will be helped than will be harmed uh, if those are withdrawn. Uh, now, my view, my own view, uh, is that they're underestimating the economic, uh, political, and media blowback uh, from overturning the subsidies in the 36 or 37 states. Um, you can always say that the White House should have avoided the problem by not handing out illegal subsidies, uh, but the public may not notice and may not care about that difference once the people who are on Obamacare can suddenly no longer afford to do so. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one thing to understand is that inside of Obamacare plans are embedded all kinds of other political goals that have nothing to do with universal coverage. Part of it is income redistribution, part of it is to convert insurers into utilities, and that's raised the price uh, of Obamacare policies. The subsidies are meant to counteract that, to make them artificially cheap. If they're withdrawn, uh, about five million people at this point, potentially 10 million going forward, would be exposed to the true cost of President Obama's agenda and may not be happy about it. <coughs> and I think what could happen is you could see a replay, uh, sort of a bad flashback of the, if you like your health plan, you can keep your plan. If you like your, your doctor, you can keep your doctor, except only in reverse, this time with the Republicans accused of denying care to the sick. The other thing that will happen uh, is that President Obama will demand uh, that congressional Republicans simply pass a one-sentence bill restoring the subsidies on the federal exchanges. If they refuse without an answer of their own, uh, the public may conclude that they share the blame. This week, the White House said that they have no backup plan, no plan B, 
whatsoever if the subsidies are struck down. I think that's a little bit silly. I think they do have these backup plans, but what they're trying to do is increase pressure on Congress. What they're also trying to do is force Republican governors to join the federal exchange. They will come under tremendous pressure uh, from the insurers and the hospitals that have spent five years adopting, uh, adapting, excuse me, <coughs> to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and they'll also come under pressure from their own constituents denied benefits. Now, some of them would resist for a time, just like they did uh, on joining uh, Obamacare's new Medicaid program, uh, but I don't think they'll do so for very long. And what, that ha what happens in that case is that you lend a bipartisan gloss to the Affordable Care Act that it's never had. You have Republican governors who are giving it new legitimacy in Washington, while also alienating their own voters uh, at home. And this will be a big political problem. And it's really the most interesting fissure right now in conservative politics. Uh, the far better alternative, in my view, to avoid uh, some of these problems is for Republicans to respond to President Obama's ultimatums with their own proposals. He won't agree to anything that repeals or defunds or, or cripples his signature achievement, but who also needs something from Congress, and he's never really been in that position uh, before since, since Republicans took over. Uh, and so the, the immediate GOP goal should, make, should be to make insurance cheaper so people don't need so much of a subsidy uh, to obtain insurance. And this means essentially deregulating the exchanges plank by plank. Lift the regulations, lift the taxes, devolve to the states more of a role in controlling their own insurance market. The private market will gradually heal uh, and prices will fall. You can say to the liberal states that prefer Obamacare command and control, if you like your, fed, if you like your state based exchange, you can keep it. Here's what we're going to do instead of forcing consumers into the Washington design plans uh, that now are sold uh, on the exchanges. Now, in return, I think Republicans can offer to restore some of the subsidies for, for the White House, maybe smaller, maybe in the form. Uh, of a fixed tax credit uh, for people who, again, don't benefit from the tax preference for employer-sponsored insurance. And this would really be a down payment on a larger reform that would happen after President Obama leaves office. You essentially create a holding pen and throw this entire debate into the 2016 presidential race uh, where the candidates from both parties, I think, would would be forced, uh, in this case, to have an instructive debate about their vision for a post-Obamacare world. Now, the good news is that the smarter Republicans uh, are, are headed in that direction. Uh, this month, we saw Orrin Hatch of the Senate Finance Committee uh, and Fred Upton of, of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. These are the ones with jurisdiction uh, over health care. They've come to a consensus that they're trying to send to their members. You can also expect to see on Tuesday a plan from Paul Ryan and some other House Republicans that is very much worth watching. And the real challenge will be to come to a consensus around uh, one of these alternatives. Now, this won't satisfy uh, everyone on the right. Some think we can revert uh, to, to a free market paradise, one I don't think uh, ever existed. Uh, and, and they think no, that nothing, literally nothing, uh, is better than Obamacare light. Uh, and this, to me, will become one of the most fascinating uh, presidential debates uh, in a long time. And one way to tell the difference between a candidate with a substantive agenda, a substantive reform agenda, uh, and those who were just uh, posturing. Uh, and one thing I guess I would say is that the American political system, as, as you're thinking about this in, in, in your own way, evaluating the candidates, one thing is that the American political system uh, is supposed to make change hard. It's supposed to be incremental. It's supposed to be slow. It's supposed to be evolutionary. And one reason 
that Obamacare is so bad is that it violates these norms. It's a dramatic and convulsive change uh, in, in a way that the American p political system was never designed to accommodate. So when you consider the ambitions of the Republicans, and there are so many of them running for the White House, uh, the serious ones, I think, will be the ones who say that we can turn around the battleship slowly, move from consolidation to competition, uh, from government to liberty, uh, from central planning uh, to markets. Um, I think they'll also recognize that voters tend to like both Republican and Democratic ideas and can reasonably ask, why can't we combine the best from both sides? More coverage from Obamacare, more market-based alternatives from Republicans. We haven't seen this in politics, but I think there's an opening for a candidate to succeed uh, who, can, who can offer a more realistic, more pragmatic alternative that could potentially appeal uh, to members of both parties. Now, this isn't how politics is operated in the Obama era, but luckily, uh, we are beginning a new one. Uh, the candidate, I think, who succeeds uh, will restore markets, try to restore markets to health care, as I said, turn the battleship around, uh, convince voters that they should have more control over their own health care dollars uh, rather than the federal government. And this would be an experiment, uh, unfortunately, one that we have never uh, tried. Uh, and so I hope we're about to do so. I think there are reasons for optimism, and that's all I have to say about that. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Sure. Uh, no, I'm trying to convince them to offer one, but I think I think you will see uh, uh, some some real substance uh, from the candidates this year. I think it'll be a policy-heavy debate. Uh, so far, the only candidate with a plan uh, is Bobby Jindal. Uh, it's at least he has a plan, which is more than anyone else can say. Uh, but it's really firmly in the do-nothing camp. It's saying. Don't try to compromise. Don't come up with an alternative. Uh, let's hold firm. Let's fight. Uh, and I, I don't think he's going to get a lot of traction with that, but I'm always happy to be proven wrong. Yeah, I, th I think um, it, it would definitely be a step forward, at least at first. Uh, once you start to get a cascade of, of bad politics stemming from that, I think you could move even faster in the other direction. Uh, so on day one, uh, I, I would be thrilled. After that, I'm afraid Republicans will once again become the dog that caught the car and don't know what the heck to do with it. Uh, and I mean, I. I was just in uh, Washington on uh, Tuesday, and th there really is kind of a panic setting in. Uh, it, it's among all the, th the three groups I recognize. I mean, they're, it, it's, it, they are truly worried uh, about what would happen. And I don't think I talked to anybody who is thrilled that this case is going forward, except for maybe the two scholars who, who uh, kind of developed this case. One is Michael Cannon of the Cato Institute. The other is Jonathan Adler uh, of Case Western University. Uh, and one has legal training. One, uh, uh, Michael Cannon, has a ton of healthcare training. And they, they really generated this case. I wonder if they're not going to have a hangover as a result. <laughs> Thank you. 
one more. Um, how did you, I guess the Obamacare is kind of a hot topic from the beginning, but how did you decide to start writing about it? And did you take, did you have a some goal in mind to set your own writing about it apart? Sure. Well, I started covering healthcare completely by accident. Uh, I, um, I started the journal as an intern in 2005 and soon thereafter was brought over uh, to start writing editorials and they needed someone to write about healthcare. Uh, so at, at that point it was just kind of dutifully file stories that never go anywhere. Had I known uh, what President Obama's election ultimately would have meant, uh, at least for me, I might have voted for him. Uh, but it, it, as, as I said, I, I just, I, I really lucked out and, and happened to be at a, a great institution writing about an important topic and an important time. Uh, and, and I'm pretty grateful that you had those moons align. <laughs> All right, Joe, thank you very much. Well, thanks.